Um, I'm Brian Biggs. I'm the uh, Director of Cultural Legacies uh, here at Bluecoat, and uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, the event this evening. Welcome uh, to this event. Um, Laura Marie Brown is going to be chairing the event, but I'm, I want to say a little bit first about so why we're organising this event and also what um, artist practice means to Bluecoat. And I, I'm sure most of you know, because we keep banging on about it, but we are the oldest art centre in the UK. And as such, we have the, the first um, artist studios in the city. And that was, they were established in 1907, a long time ago. And we're, but we're, we've continued throughout the last century and into this century to put artists at the heart of what we do. So we're really keen to find out uh, what are the needs of artists. And that's really what this evening is about and and we've got some a great panel of artists that we're going to uh, share with you shortly and they're going to be talking about some of the challenges facing artist studios in the city and we want to learn from that as I say so um, just to say a little bit about Blue Coat as a place for artists um, we support artists in lots of different ways if you haven't seen it there's a great exhibition downstairs in our uh, VED space uh, called a creative community and that gives you a bit of a snapshot of um, artists who are working here today, 15 photographs of artists whose work ranges from painting to installation to dance to sound to illustration to crafts, a really wide mix of, of artists. Um, and that we've extended that for another month, so it's on till the end of, end of November. So do come along and see that if you haven't already. But alongside providing artist studios, we also do have um, printmaking studios um, for artists. Um, and we're just glad to say that we've reopened those again after a very long uh, period of, of, of shutdown um, and we also provide individual support for artists um, our head of program Marianne McQuay has been really busy over lockdown giving very valuable uh, advice to artists who are applying for funding at a very difficult time so that individual um, support for artists and some mentoring that's part of what we do uh, we have a great program called Pivot which is a collaboration with uh, Castlefield in Manchester to support five artists over a two-year period uh, in, in sort of continuing professional development. Uh, there's residency opportunities um, and of course we exhibit artists from the city in our shows and again if you haven't seen it come and see our new show because it's got a great piece of work by uh, installation by Samoya Kader uh, who's showing along with two other artists. It's a really lovely show um, so we will show local artists as well um, and I think finally just the fact that we're right in the middle of the city centre that we have this long history with artists. It's a place for artists. It's a great place to meet. And you'll always find artists in the hub, in the cafe, in the garden meeting. So that's why we feel that we're still a centre for artists. Um, and this evening, I want to find out a bit more about the artists who aren't in this building, uh, but other artists across the, across the city region. And it is about the city region. It's not just about Liverpool. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Laura Marie Brown, uh, who's going to introduce the panel. Uh, and chair the discussion this evening. Over to you, Laura. I'm give you a quick, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to um, this event and before I introduce our panel. The art we see on our streets and on our gallery walls doesn't come from a vacuum. Creativity, creating art and new work, it needs space, space to think, space to build and space to grow. Our creative communities need their spaces. Last summer, as uncertainty found its way into all the cracks in our creative industries, Patrick Kirksmith and I, who both worked together on Independence Biennial, began talking to the city region's artist studios. They weren't in a good place. They were unsure of what support they were entitled to and even unsure as to where they needed to go to get help. That started a process that developed into the drafting of the State of the Studios report, which we published last year. With around 35 artist studios across Liverpool city region, their future was uncertain and with it, their role in our vibrant arts community and the creative econ economy would be unsettled by losing those studios. I'm in Blue Coat Library as you can see behind me. And all around me on the corridors here and above are artist studios. And they're dotted all over the city. They're in Wirral as well. They're in St. Helens and Knowsley and Sefton. The challenges our artist studios face in 2020, which are reflected in the State of the Studios report, are not purely of the pandemic's making. Like so many other industries, the past 18 months has basically highlighted fragility. 
What we wanted to do with this event was to bring together different voices and perspectives to discuss some of the issues that we talked about in the report and also to reflect on their future. What role do artist studios play in our creative communities? What do they need and how can we strengthen their future? We'll be providing some links and things for you to point you towards to, to read about it and discover more about it afterwards. You don't have to have read the report. Don't worry about that. Um, first of all, let me introduce you to our panel. Um, Brigitte Dirac is from Al Alternator Studios in Birkenhead. Claire Wheatman is from Platform Studios in St. Helens. Michelle Peterkin Walker is an artist and her studio is at Aspen Yard. Patrick Kirk Smith is director of Independence Biennial and also he is art in Liverpool. And Erica Rushton is a creative economist, the former chair of Baltic Creative, and she works with creative communities to explore alternative models and ways of working. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, panel, is let you introduce yourselves and your work, um, and I'll go around from who I can see. So, Brigitte, you're first. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for thinking of Alternator Studios and me uh, in this discussion. Uh, there will be a set of very random pictures I took uh, two days ago in my studio. Um, Alternator Studio... So my name is Brigitte Jurok. I'm an artist, but I'm also a university lecturer. I'm head of sculpture in Manchester uh, School of Art. So like many artists, I have two jobs. One is um, being in the studio and the other one is finding the financial um, resources to um, subsidize my life and my work in the studio. Um, this is only an introduction. So we talk a little bit later. Alternator Studio is a... Um, this building there, perfect timing, uh, Victorian, late Victorian bakery, uh, right in the centre or just on the way to the Williamson Art Gallery in Birkenhead. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when we are in the panel discussion. Thank you. And uh, next is Claire from Platform Studios in St. Helens. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Claire Wheatman. I'm a visual artist. I work freelance a lot. Um, with communities and um, in education and um, wherever there's freelance work, as that would be the case for a lot of artists. Um, I run and was one of the founder members of Platform Studios. Um, we are in St. Helens. Um, we've been there since 2012. Um, there are currently seven artists, not a very large studio space compared to some of the spaces that you might find in, in some of the areas in the Liverpool city centre. Um, but we do provide um, space for seven artists varying from painting, photography, um, contemporary social practice. Um, and we're based above St. Mary's Market. So again, like Brigitte says, we're centrally located um, in St. Helens Town Centre. Um, and yeah, just that sense of a studio being in a place near where, where you live is that's quite important to me well, so that you can make the work whilst also doing all that other work that we can talk about. Thanks. Uh, next is Michelle. Hello and good evening everybody and thanks for inviting me to be part of the discussion today. Um, my name is Michelle, <coughs> excuse me, Peter Kim Walker and as they said I'm based at the Aspen Studios courtesy of Granby Workshop and I've been there since mm, December 2020. Um, I'm a digital artist, so I use design, photography, and I've got a background in video. Much like Claire mentioned, you look for work whenever you can find it as a freelance and self-employed individual, um, doing it self-employed, well, doing it full-time now. And my, um, I work with the community and try to engage a lot with the community through workshops, different arts and craft and creative workshops, video workshops, etc. And yeah, so my first studio. So I'll maybe have a lot to say about what I feel what studios can do. But anyway, we'll talk later. Nice to be here. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Patrick Kirksmith is uh, up next. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I run Art Liverpool and Independent Spaniel, as Laura said. Um, but I, I think, yeah, um, the more important reason why I'm here is, is um, I helped put the report together with, with Laura. And, um, yeah, I'm so interested to see everyone's opinions on their experience as studios and, you know, open about the fact that I am not in a studio. I'm in a very messy bedroom. Um, I work from home, not a studio. Um, yeah. 
That's great. Well, we might talk about why you don't have a studio. Um, next up is uh, Erica Rushton. Life as an art, or oh, am I on muted? Unmuted. Yeah, my name's Erica Rushton, um, and though I started life as an artist, I then went on to work for 20 years in um, the private and public sectors around kind of mainstream capital developments, um, businesses, you know, how things are viable. And I suppose over the last 10 years, I've brought that expertise back to look at why artists and creative communities don't function in the same way with the same kind of value. So I spend an awful lot of my time working with everything from individual creatives through to whole communities of creatives, making sure that they have a degree of independence and viability. That's awesome, thanks Erica. Um, there's so many people we could talk to um, about artist studios, we can't fit everyone <laughs> into a panel conversation. So we're going to hear throughout this event from a few artists and studios who work in Liverpool City region. Um, first video we have is from the artist Anthony Wong. Um, I'm Anthony Wong, I'm an artist based in Liverpool and I've always had a fine art studio. I took on this studio just recently but I've actually been in the blue coat since 2008. You can make a mess, you can uh, remove yourself from the, the home environment and then therefore you have some times where you do have um, solitude to think through your ideas and develop them and then other times you can um, obviously bring people in into that space which is not your home and develop in that way. As I say, ever since I have had a studio, be it here or uh, elsewhere in the city or even in a dairy block at the back of my house, it was always separate to the house. And I have tried to work from the house, but because I work in such a mixed media sort of uh, materials, then it's difficult to work in the house. And also you've, you're, always, you're always drawn to do domestic things which really you should fit in rather than those take precedent. So the general attitude I would say is, oh, you've got a studio and you play in it. So the, the idea of playing and work gives that divide, I would say. If you need to work on or you need that extended time or you, you're the type of person who works through the night or you're an artist who's got a day job and has to do the day job to afford the studio, then you need the extension of hours, you need the free time. So I think studios need to be pretty much fully accessible. So that was uh, artist Anthony Wong. Um, first of all, we're gonna give a kind of overview of the State of the Studios report um, that Patrick Kirksmith and I co-authored um, last year. Patrick, I guess it's probably going to be most useful to kind of sort out and say why we, why we wrote the report, where it started. Yeah, um, well, I mean, we, we were in the really fortunate position um, I mean, through, through a series of unfortunate positions um, to receive the emergency funding from Arts Council um, with, with Art in Liverpool. We were in that position because Independence Biennial had been postponed, because funding had been postponed, um, the same for us as, as most other arts organisations at the time, um, in was it March, April last year? And I was just incredibly aware that we, we were in a position where we... We had funding to do something really special, um, and that was kind of nothing specific. But you know, we I just felt right that that should be to support those who didn't receive the funding or who weren't eligible for the funding, or to explore why they weren't eligible for the funding. Um, but as well as the funding issues, it was I think it was to do with the communication channels that were not there at all in March last year between local authority and studios. Um, and the lack of visibility of studios, not just to local authorities, but to each other. Um, 
and you you know you know as well as I do when we started the report it was I think everybody involved in the report including us and the studios were surprised by how many studios there, there were you know I, I knew there were a lot of studios in Merseyside no one had ever actually sat down and counted them um, and we ended up with 36 which dropped to 33 by the time we ended the report and I think is now back up to 36 because there's a couple of new ones in the world just this year so it's sort of it was interesting seeing that sort of live change while we were doing the report yeah, definitely. I think the first thing we did was create a Google map yep. so that we could map where all of the studios were and see the clusters and see where they weren't as well. And yep. then the process was starting to do a lot of research. The, the structure of the report was essentially having a, an overview of what an artist studio is um, and some of the challenges that artist studios were facing. Um, I think one of the things that struck me about it, and I wanted to hear your perspective on it as well, was actually how hard it was to find relevant information about artist studios that would help inform it. Yeah, I mean, you can see the citations in the report in themselves, I think, evidence the lack of information there was beforehand. In the Even when you, when you look at national surveys on, on studios um, around the UK, when they came to Liverpool in 1997, I think it was, with the report we cited. Um, the, and this is a report that was supposed to list essentially every visual artist studio in the UK. They listed three. And in 1997, I'm a, I'm a, I was seven years old, but I'm aware that there were a lot more than three studios in Liverpool. And there are studios that still exist now that were around then that weren't in those reports. So it's sort of regardless of the amount of funding that's been thrown into these reports, it's never given a real picture of, of who they are. And I think that's part of the importance of this report is that it's done with the studios. You know, um, it's been done collaboratively with the studios in a way that actually helps us to understand rather than us just talking at them. So from a findings perspective, <laughs> How were the studios doing in 2020? What was the main challenges they were facing? Yeah. Um, I think the the challenges in 2020 were exacerbated. I don't, I don't think there was any challenge in 2020 that was absolutely created by the pandemic. You know, the, the funding issues were there. The affordability of space was there. The conversations that were impossible with landlords were there. The... 15 year lease term that you need to have to access any sort of buildings improvement funding that was already there. So the state of the studios, as in the title of the report, didn't massively change in 2020. It just condensed the issues and became an emergency as everything did. One of the key issues as well was around how the, the, the market forces at play with artist studios. Um, it is something I think that is very well known within the creative community in Liverpool of how peripatetic you feel that you have to travel around and there are pockets of the city that become affordable at different times and you kind of swoop in and then you get moved out and then you swoop in somewhere else then you get moved out. I think can you talk a little bit about what we found out about the sort of the numbers involved and kind of like the the rates of artists pay that I think were really critical when we were talking around so, sort of the, the economic viability of a lot of studio models? Yeah, so um, I'm struggling to remember the exact figures in of, of the studio rates, but, you know, the there's always that headline figure of the, the average artist salary in the UK in 2020 from their practice was six thousand pounds. Um, you know that's topped up with other work, but six thousand pounds is what they make from their practice. Um, and if you're putting seventy-two pounds a month-ish into a studio, um, or up to seventy-two pounds a month, depending on which studio you're in, um, that's a decent portion of of your artist income gone back on studio, um, which is off-putting for a lot of artists. And I think it's you know it's a big reason why 
when we look at the studios and there's I think we worked out there were about 500 artists across the studios in Merseyside in, in total um that's 500 artists that have deemed it worth being in a studio financially despite a general low rate of pay um and I think that was where it went beyond the numbers because it's it's trying to understand what the value of studio is to to an artist beyond beyond the financial um impact on on the you know on their bank it's sort of that there's something more to studios than than finance which leads perfectly into the next question <laughs> what role do what role do artist studios play in our in our very varied arts arts community and creative community what role do yeah. the artist studios play here do you think um, I think it depends completely on the individual studio and the artist and what the artist wants to get out of that. You, know, you could be in one studio and be completely isolated. And in that sense, that's an incredibly useful place to be because you're away from home, you're away from distraction, and you're able to focus on your work. Um, in other studios, in group settings, you've got collaboration, you've got ideas, generation. Um, I can only really talk from personal experience. You know, I'm, I'm currently sat in this unfinished bedroom um which has been my office and life for 40 odd hours a week for the last two years and art in liverpool or since i've been in charge of art in liverpool we've never had an office we've never had a studio and, uh, apart from a few rare times where you know road studios incredibly kindly gave me associate space for uh, about six months in 2016 and it was an incredible time because you're able to host meetings, you're able to host people in person in a working space, you're able to have those conversations with artists and know what's happening in their lives. Um, and I think looking at 2020, 2021, conversations I've had with artists who are in studios, pitted against my own experience of coming out of lockdown is that the studios have made it much easier to bounce back and sort of be part of that working environment as opposed to sort of being cooped up and still in that kind of lockdown brain and working around your own sort of internal issues um i think studios can give you that space to escape as well as to collaborate i remember as well one of the things that, that came across as well in the report that when we were talking to people it was the accessibility of the studios in terms of exhibition space. One of the big challenges, I think anyone who puts art on in Liverpool knows the challenge of finding space to do something. Um, we have a lot of galleries, we have a lot of museums, there's a lot of places to present art, but it is quite hard to get your foot into the door in many ways. Um, and studios provide that physical space for exhibition, which is so important in, in, in terms of getting on that, that ladder, I suppose. And you who, you know, review art through Art and Liverpool, I guess you see that firsthand a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was another point that we went over for probably two weeks before we even wrote a single word for the report is how do we define an artist studio? Um, you know, art, is it is is the sole purpose of the artist studio to be an arts community to support a group of artists you know an established group of artists or is it to provide space um ob obviously it's both but i think where to draw the line was quite difficult for us um and i i, th I think a really good example of that is is probably convenience um where you look at the way that they're supporting a group of artists very directly they have they have making space but limited making space and primarily um it's a vehicle for exhibition but you know it's an incredible way to kind of rethink how studios work when you are, are limited on space and when you're limited on what you can do physically to still be able to present and create a program um you know I'm not being paid to say this, but in cahoots, um, their current program is absolutely incredible. And that is a studio led program that wouldn't be out of place in any of the major galleries. Um, and I think, I think, you know, see, seeing those sorts of programs, similarly, I'm sure Brigitte will pick up on this later with, um, with Alternator and Translating the Street. There are those sorts of programs where that relationship between a studio and the community it's part of 
can't be replicated by a big gallery. That that's unique to studios, and that's a unique um, road to certain types of practice for artists that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. We obviously can't um, provide a platform to like every single one of the 35 studios on this event, as much as I'd love it. Um, I mean, the artist studio network meetings were challenging enough in, in lockdown, as delightful as it was to be able to see each other when we couldn't um, <laughs> see everyone physically. But some of the stories that came out when we were doing the report, um, there was real frustration from a lot of studios that they felt the sheer unpredictability and insecurity of their situation was just making a lot of people feel like they just couldn't be bothered fighting against it anymore. And that was something that I think the two of us really picked up on when we were compiling that report and researching it, was just there was a lot of anger of, I don't understand why this is so hard, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think there's two things I'll try and pick up on. Um, I'll try not to forget the first one. But um, <laughs> the, the other thing was, so the, the anger and the frustration and that idea of giving up on things, I think is, um, you know, you, you know I've, I've, I've had this with Art in Liverpool this year, it, but there's, there's, a, there's a simplicity to having and running and managing something that you love. And knowing that whatever happens financially, that can start again. And that works when it's small and that works when it's independent and it works when it's a, a group of friends or colleagues that work together and genuinely care about what they do. Um, I think if we're completely honest, if lockdown had destroyed the most passionate studios, I imagine they would all have bounced back in a few years time in, in a different form. Um, the same with Art in Liverpool. You know, if, if, if we'd gone a different way with funding and Art in Liverpool had ceased, there's no way that Art in Liverpool wouldn't have come back. Um, it's, so that, that, I think that's, that's one thing. The frustration is there, but the frustration is led by a, a, a fear of the connection to, to, the, to the thing that you love. And for the people that run studios, that is a thing that they genuinely love. It's not a job. For most of them, it's not something that pays. It's a, it's a voluntary role for, for most studio leaders. Um, the other thing to say was just the point on um, the challenges of coordinating the meetings, um, which was, you know, the reason we were coordinating the meetings is because we were in a position to do it. You know, we, we were in paid roles through Art and Liverpool to, to do that, and the studio directors weren't. So that, that's how the studio network came about. It's how the studio report came about. It's because two people in fairly poorly paid positions, if we're honest, um, but two people in paid positions, you know, just did something and, and it created a report and it created a network. The challenges of that are keeping it going. And there's only so far passion can take you um, with those sorts of projects. And I, I think, you know, it, it's not going to, it's not going to die a death, but it, it should continue, but I think it's always about making sure it's the right people at the helm and making sure it's um, a combination of sort of passion and experience, but also stability that are, that are there. So, um, yeah, well done me. I remembered the first point after the second point. Um, yeah. How was the report received when we, when it was finally published? <laughs> I seem to remember it was a while to publish it, but um, when yeah. it was finally sent out, how, would, how did it go down? Um, I mean, the, the day it was sent out was the day I started furlough. Um, so I, I, the, the absolute immediate impact of the report, I never really got to see. Um, so I, I got back a month, I, I finished a month furlough um, just after the report was sort of a, a month out into the ether. But the feedback we had, um, particularly from the smaller local authorities, I think was incredible. Um, from St. Helens, from Knowsley, um, from Sefton as well, in terms of specific resources and specific support that have been offered to um, some startups that still haven't actually announced themselves. But, but you know, the, there are support programs that have begun in some of the smaller councils. Um, Liverpool City Council, as always, are responsive. Um, City region, you know, we it, 
it, it, it's hard. I, I, I don't I don't want to specifically attack any particular council body, but you know, there's the support for a music board and the support for visual arts, and there is a separation between the two, and there is a separation of the problems they face. Um, I think probably the biggest response we got was from Arts Council. Um, you know, there, there have been several meetings with Arts Council representatives um, since the report was published. Um, there have been actions that have been promised, similarly with, with galleries, including Blue Coat, in terms of actions that have been promised where they can support and actively, you know, um, mentor artists and artist studios into, into funding situations. Um, but there's still that fundamental issue of how do we address the security of space? Yeah, I think that's something we're going to talk talk about a little bit later on in the event as well. Um, Patrick, that was great. Um, we're going to introduce the next short film now, which is uh, talking to artist um, Pete Clark. My name's Pete Clark. Uh, I work in Studio 4 at the Blue Coat. Uh, generally speaking, my work uh, is based around painting, printmaking and drawing. Uh, I'm quite interested in the relationship between words and images and quite often use poetry um, in the paintings. Sometimes I, in the past I've collaborated with Robert Shepherd, a Liverpool poet, to make um, work together. Well, there are strange contradiction studios, aren't they? Because on one hand, I like to see my work as being um, exploring social landscapes and being engaged with the outside the world. Outside. But then, of course, I lock then, myself course, I lock in myself an inside, in an inside. and spend most of the time here on my own, uh, making paintings, thinking about what I'm doing, researching, maybe reading. During lockdown, I, I spent a lot of time at home making drawings and small works. But that notion of going out to work, to go into a studio, is quite important. Um, I, I leave leave home, come here, and sometimes I'm generally not sure, because I work on a lot of things at the same time, I'm not really sure what I'm planning to do for the day. Um, and so I come here, make some tea, sit down, look at what I've been working on, and then slowly I realise I've been working for a few hours. Many years ago I was part of Liverpool Artists Workshop and we, did, we set up studios in sort of rundown spaces. Uh, and they were sort of like mini art schools and to a certain extent some of the studio groups in Liverpool were a bit like that but I didn't really want that, I wanted the sort of, I don't want to come here and socialise to a certain extent, I mean obviously I do but I, I, don't, I don't want that sort of art schooly type, you know, with people working in chipboard boxes next door to each other, I like this sort of, um, the, the fact I can sit here and think my own thoughts and think about what I'm doing. I have to say, um, Pete's studio is one of the, it's like the quintessential artist studio. The floor is covered in like paint from where he paints on the floor. There are um, pictures everywhere. It is just such a gorgeous space. I, I recommend making friends with Pete Clark so you can hang out in his studio. Um, so the next section, we're going to have a chat about artist studios and the role artists play in practice and everything. Um, so we've got Brigitte Direct from Alternator, we've got Claire Wheatman from Platform, and we've got Michelle Peaskin Walker from, um, who's an artist based at uh, Aspen Yard Studios as well. Um, I'm going to sort of first ask you all, kind of, what role does the studio play in your in your arts practice. Um, Claire, do you want to do you want to kick off? Uh, yeah. Um, so I I had a I had a studio before we set up Platform Studios because I just felt that I needed that space to keep all of the stuff that sometimes I need to use to make things. So I, anybody who's been in my studio and goes could just do with such and such a thing. I can oh yeah, I've got one of those over here. 
and just that sense that I can have an idea and then have things at my fingertips to realize it and to um, I think what Anthony was saying in the video earlier was that idea that you can sometimes just play with things and Pete said he you know not knowing what you're going to do sometimes that's a really useful space to have um, but also I think just that sense that you can yeah go right now because um, I have small children so that sense that I can drop one of them off at school and then go straight to straight to the studio and then I know that I've got a certain amount of time that I'm there is is that really good sort of protective space of this is work and this is you know this is what I do for a living this is where it is and this is how I can can look after that I think that's really useful for me. Brigitte is it the same for you because you wear a, a lot of hats well I think, I think I've, yeah I think it was quite sweet I mean the word bedroom has come up a few times already and the word um, going away from home and going somewhere else and I just wanted to say I think a studio could be just the inside of your laptop I mean I don't think it needs to be a piece of real estate I think what has come through the videos and which is also kind of what Claire's picked up from is that it's a professional working environment which is not distracted by laundry kids everything else i mean especially for women artists i mean i, I do remember them when, when my kids were small the second front room was my studio um you know so 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 and i mentioned that in whatever brief i'd sent you know i've been in bridewell in the prison cell i've been on duke street as a sculptor on the third floor which is completely stupid uh in in the bedroom and 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 wherever else and i i think the key word for me is I'm a sculptor. So ground floor is like wow, or a lift is like double wow. So when the, the blue coat got refurbished and the beautiful sculpture studio, which was on the ground floor, became uh, the design shop, um, I know it has a lift, the blue coat, but I kind of suddenly realized that my work is too big and I make too much for a studio um, in the city centre of Liverpool, where the bollards go up at 10 o'clock in the morning and you can't get in and out. So so everyone has got different needs. And then you talked about regeneration. And of course, there is the insecurity of being in and out uh, of studios. And I was in the fortunate position of falling in love with a building and managing to somehow raise the money to buy it. Uh, I don't have the money to, you know, keep it updated or whatever else but I have tenants and uh, you talked about community and and Pete Clark also talked about like kind of you know some people just want to go in the studio to shut everyone off so we've managed to sort of have a sort of a hybrid version so the studio is very much like hidden there's not a big sign on the front saying artist studio but that's more to keep the burglars away and then and inside people who all have other jobs as well make their work but then now and again we break out of it and i feel that's really important which is kind of rejuvenizing your or rejuvenation of your studio so i initiated this sort of translating the street which are international artist micro residencies and brian mentioned something earlier about blue could supporting local artists and I have this sort of, I can't stand the word local artist and local artist and international artist. It's sorry, Brian. Uh, we can have a separate discussion about it. What I realize in Birkenhead, which is very cheap, um, there are lots of independent shops and they are run by people who come from other parts of the world. Their first language is not English. So I wanted artists which I could get uh, hands on who spoke the language of these local shops to have little residences and then make work in situ in these shops so it wasn't a very mod you know it wasn't it wasn't about filling empty shops like what's been happening in other parts of Birkenhead it was actually acknowledging that there's a rich culture on the doorstep of my studio and celebrating that and kind of may leaving a sort of sporadic sort of sp sporadic outward facing activity so to speak so the studio has sort of you know is is like a hermitage for the artists who are renting it so to speak and although i have a project space that project space actually needs money to become a project space so so it's more like a metaphor so 
so and then the studio kind of works on a different level and it's not an open studio it's actually a curated program of bringing other artists in so they kind of can you know break up rot from within and also kind of bring something to where we are so and for that bit we talked about funding before i did ask for funding from the arts council and i was successful in doing it i started and this is my last sentence i came to birkenhead in 2012 to this studio now of course birkenhead is a new hot put hot hot to be gentle. The future is Birkenhead, I keep yeah. being told. Yeah. The future is Birkenhead. And I said that 2012 and absolutely, uh, you know, you are tucked away and it's worse than Gateshead. Nobody comes across the water. But now, now, of course, there are the, the future yard, the music people, which always so terrifically well connected, they catapulted themselves into the Guardian front page, like within what, a month of starting something. So, I suppose it'll be very interesting to kind of, you know, later on in the discussion to kind of, you know, I just use it to think and to make work and to have that sort of interesting international angle or multi-language, actually, rather than calling it international, maybe call it multilingual, uh, multilingual kind of um, residencies popping up now and then. Yeah, I can't, believe you, I can't believe you just call the future yard lads gentrifiers, Brigitte. Um. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, you know, the more the merrier. The good thing is, is everything's on the doorstep. You know, it's kind of perfect, you know. I can walk to Builders Merchant. I mean, where can you do that? You know, I mean, uh, I don't know. Michelle, you said that Aspen Yard's your, your first artist studio. Uh, yeah. it's, one of, it's new, isn't it? It's, it's right in Granby. How are you finding it? How's it? What kind of role is it playing in your practice? Okay, yeah. So it's right in the heart of LA and it's in Lodge Lane. Everyone knows how Lodge Lane's kind of a new food quarter now. So it's really a, a kind of popular, busy street. For me, it's much of the things that um, Anthony Wong spoke about. Moving out of my, as a self-employed person from my small flat into a space. So for me, as free benefits, it's a gallery space where I can show my art. I actually show the art of myself and a few other art, a few female, about three other female artists. Um, it's a shop. People can now come in and actually see and feel touched by the cards, the argon pyramids and stuff. So it's also that. And for me, it was a key workspace. So it's different. And I have digital art. But I also finish some things with hand finished paint and stuff like that, and some of the illustrations that I work on, and just the larger um, bespoke pieces. So I actually have a place that I could actually do that free, easy, and it gives you that whole mindset to create. Much like what everybody spoke about, you know, I've got the twofold benefits. So there's a time when I need it to be kind of, yeah, quiet and not want to talk to anybody and stuff like that, which it really can be difficult at times just going to be a bit disciplined with how we have to work sometimes I still go back to home but it is key for me to be around a network of people so even this idea of the collaborations which have already started forming them since I've been in there with like the goddess project and we're actually working mutually on something the ideas we've been coming up with you know and for me even when you talk about the report and the omissions about diversity and access and stuff it's a real key thing what for me Grammy Workshop and Aspen Yard have done because I still have to give them a major shout out to talk about these omissions for people like the African presence in art, the African presence in Liverpool, and why African is what people refer to as black. Yeah. So it's the so to be seen and have a, a space that we can also create, interact, and then grow, evolve, blossom, and do all these things, it's really key. So the fact that they also gave us a studio to set up in free you know, gave us ample time to help get you set up rather than oh, get in there and fail because we know it's costly to run as a, what's his name, just spoke about running studio. So they've given us this to help us really set up. But I think it's also key about this thing we talk about, the diversity and how you, where, where you have people on steering groups because they've got a diverse staff team, obviously, and, and practising artists who would also work, work within the Granby workshop. So when they decided, OK, people have probably put forward ideas They've obviously been listened to and it's real measures that they've done. So for the places I'm working amongst, it's really nice. And it's still, um, it's new, as we said, so it's still navigating its space. Being that Aries, I was like, ah, the first in there, you know. 
<laughs> I've had to come and be like everybody else learning this thing about how cold artist studios are, which is um it's a real it's it's a it's a laughable fact but not because you use oil burners, but the point is even as a person of African ancestry, we have to have warmth. So even to, to, to be comfortable to create and feel at ease, it can be a real factor. So there's all these different things you're navigating, but the networking and the emotional support is key. You know, you can't be without these key things for me when, especially being like, and um, I mentioned about coming out of COVID, it really helped me just to fix up the studio and then link with the creatives there as well as the other other wider creatives who were there. So there's people like Toxic Gallery and Claire Beloved, Dre's Desserts, and then the whole Granby workshop. So there's this lovely energy that you can build into. And for me, my space is an indoor space, but I can actually easily go downstairs into the yard and work. So yeah, it's it, it, for me to be made, it's all good, you know, right now, but I know I've, I'm potentially aware of all the pitfalls that can come. But one of the key things I had to say to myself is weigh up the financial benefit where you talked about um, earlier, the um, unseen benefit, which is not financial. So even for me, I realised I can never go back to my that's that flat and that setup after being in a studio. So I have to find whatever financial money, whether it's even my own personal pocket, whatever I do, whether it's successful business or not, and maintain this studio because I can see the the holistic benefit for me. So it is a real toss up and it, there are real factors behind it. But um, yeah, I can only smile. So anyone that's seen all my posts on social media and stuff, you'll see me killing teeth like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at the studio. So even that one of those pictures you've seen, you know, one of the people down there, biodiversity is Andrea with the beekeeping. Then we've also got a baker. So it's just it's sitting outside while I'm working <laughs> and getting creative <laughs> ideas, you know, to eat freshly natural honey and fresh baked scones from another creators down on that site is really nice and we're new so we're at the stage of where we're looking to find ways that we can interact more with the community obviously we're going to be doing a project and a workshop upstairs in one of our um studios with the goddess project so there's ways in which we can collaborate but yeah it's gave me the freedom it's given me a headspace it's allowed me to interchange like the um, one the artist mentioned jump from a to b whether I'm doing design, whether they decide to do some illustration or I'm actually working on the video editing project, which is um, the Your Lens on LA, um, what I'm running at right now, it's that. But um, I guess the other thing to flag up for me would be, yeah, that's 24-hour access, but the same thing about heating, working, when you get that real vibe and buzz till hours in the morning, how comfortable do I feel? I'm still not at that same ease just to sit and do it till three. Maybe I'll stay till 10, 10 p.m. and stuff, but it's working with this whole thing. So how does it work? But there's a, a, obviously a great need, you know, and a high beneficial need for, what we, for, for me. And I think I'm not, my experience isn't unique. That's, That's I'm, I'm, I'm so, so jealous. jealous. Somebody, Somebody being in the studio you. with desserts by Dre because they're so gorgeous um claire what what challenges are you sort of facing at platform arts at the moment what what do you need right now well i think the thing that is often the case with studios and i think was it patrick who spoke about it was that uh, and well, i think yourself as well that um transience that often people have in studios that studios are often required to move and as brigitte was saying about birkenhead being up and coming St Helens has recently announced its um, plans for you know to regenerate the town and to redevelop and so the the medium term future of the of our location is that one day it will not exist anymore so that's there's always that sense that when you don't own the property or you don't own the, the thing that you're at the behest of what the landlord will do with the with the with the space um, and that's not uh, exclusive to us in platform I know that's something that have you know that is across lots of people so I think that's what what we're exploring now in St Helens uh, a little bit and how that works with with regeneration um, agendas um, so yeah we're at the very early stages of seeing what happens what happens next but we are in we do have good relationships with the local authority who are our landlords and who are involved in that whole regeneration scheme so it feels as though it feels as though with these conversations that are happening 
and with the conversations that we have with those places that maybe we could do something useful and i'm interested in what erica has to say about those models as well because i think that's um yeah just that sense that yeah transience of things and um as um michelle was talking about often artist studios are cold we're really fortunate that we're above a heated market and they've just fixed the heated um, so we were never cold anyway, and now it's really toasty. Um, but the, there's just artists seem to have this magical ability to just go, okay, there's a space. Let's make that work for us, and um, and make what is you know an old office space, an old bakery, a a, a yard, you know, all of these spaces that are not purpose built for artist studios they've not necessarily got natural light they've not necessarily got got warmth so you can work they're not necessarily you know they're at the top of 38 stairs uh, through, through narrow doors so you cut you have to do a certain type of work and you it shuts at six o'clock so therefore you have to do it work a certain set of hours um there's all these kind of like parameters that are just not conducive to lots of different the, the way that artists have to make work because artists are trying to fit work in around pay all the paid work and you know, Michelle was saying you comfortable stay until ten, but not until not until three. You know that 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 sense of how creativity sometimes works. It's just yeah, isn't always met by the the spaces that we have available. Um, yeah, that what we kind of make it work, but we don't know how we do it. You know, and I think that applies across you know just general arts work as well. I've seen some in the comments the um, and the live stream as well yeah just that sense of how how do we even do this what how how are we still here exactly and that's something we'll we'll go on to in a bit this, this panel will will come back in a in a few minutes the next studio we're uh, going to hear from is actually we've heard about them before but it's convenience gallery over the water in birkenhead Uh, Convenience Gallery is a community and contemporary arts organisation. We run exhibitions, workshops, talks, and um, a number of projects with the local community around us. Um, yes, it's predominantly looks like trying to trying to reimagine like how art can sit in like community space. Um, so we started out two years ago uh, in Birkenhead Market. Um, and obviously that's a, a, a sort of completely like non-traditional art environment. It was open as a as a sort of as, as a market daily. Um, we're bringing in different artists from around the northwest into that into that space, and sort of gave us our footing in like thinking differently about like how art can be placed because we don't have space <laughs> so essentially. So we're not we're not a shoot like you know we don't have like ten studios or five studios, or even one studio. Really, we kind of exist within this building. Um, and we, you know, uh, we, we the artists that we work with, we bring them in and offer them, you know, to use as much of the space as they want to be here when they want uh, to work with us. Come in. Um, so I, yeah, I just think it's not necessarily like what does an artist studio look like and what does it not look like. I just don't necessarily think we are a studio in in that format. Um, more of like I don't know, it's like a project space, but again, it's not our space, so we're still existing in in other people's environments but being able to use it to come up with the sort of projects that we have been doing um, and still being able to give space to the artists that we're working with. We took we took the decision near, near, near sort of uh, early on when we started to focus predominantly on like either solo collaborative or like sort of very small group shows um, and that's, that made, that changes occasionally when different sort of projects come in um, and the, out, the outcomes of those but yeah, for the most part, we, we've we've sort of aimed to like work alongside an artist to develop like new new projects, new ideas, or or existing work, but predominantly focused on like new on new work and um, obviously like site specific existing in this space. People might need to know like what's like, how do I get to the next stage of my career? I'm not I, I, I'm not I, I don't know how to write funding and I don't know where to get support to write funding. Um, and maybe I want to be a community led or community focused artist. How do I get involved with community organisations or? How do I get involved with contemporary style in galleries? I think there's like a lot, a, a lack of, a, I think there's probably like a lack of like knowledge or access to that knowledge. I mean, it's not like something that I don't necessarily have. And, you know, we, we, we're very much like sat in, in what we do. Um, but I think for the, for the wider sector, I guess more, more like open dialogue about those sort of, those sort of things would be, 
have been majorly useful because like Liverpool creating more links with like spaces in Manchester and creating more space it's more like space in London and Scotland so that we're like that our artists are able to like or well, the artists in these areas are able to like have access to more opportunities like outside of the space and then more people to come in and it just like sort of yeah I think creating those connections would be like it would be really beneficial because it means that you, know, you can still live here but then you get an opportunity it's perhaps yeah. in Newcastle or London and you're able to sort of travel really to work as well as being here. yeah yeah this is probably like an infinite not an infinite not an infinite amount of opportunities for one person in one area yeah not having to not having to uproot uproot your life and and remove yourself from your like community to be able to make your opportunities would be would be massively uh, i think important so. I'm delighted to uh, talk now to Erica Rushton, who's a creative economist, former chair of Baltic Creative, um, and just an incredible woman. I was in a meeting uh, a few months ago who basically said, what we need to do in Liverpool is clone Erica, basically, and that'll solve like 95% of our problems. <laughs> Erica, what, what are alternative models are there for studios of the different ways in which they can keep themselves viable and keep themselves working. Erica, your mic's not on. I'm just going to... Oh. Is it on? The app? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So I'll talk about a few examples, but maybe first just sort of pick behind the scenes of that a little bit. Um, I think we talk a lot about affordable housing but we don't very often talk about affordable commercial space. Um, and we'd be lying to say that most commercial space, or not most commercial space, all kinds of commercial space is subsidised. And I think sometimes as artists we're a bit shy or hesitant or feel undeserving in asking for subsidy towards the spaces we want to claim. Um, and, and Claire said an interesting thing that, she said, um, I wrote it down, artists have this amazing ability to say, let's make that work. And I think it is an amazing ability that very few people have, the ability to make a space work, no matter what space you come across, what state it's in, how big or small it is, where it is, is it an outlier, is it in the middle of something? Um, and that brings me on to value, you know, like, Studio spaces obviously have an, a value to artists, otherwise they wouldn't use them. They wouldn't use their hard-earned cash to pay rent in them. But I think the value they have to other people, lots of what I do, is kind of translate that value for people to say, actually, this is the lifeblood of your city. Without creativity, every industry stops innovation, every industry dies. And that's not to say every artist has to suddenly become an industry partnering award winner. It's that the, the spaces in which creativity can breathe and flow and ebb and interface and interact, like uh, Brit, Brit was talking about earlier, you know, that, that ability for artists to plant themselves in other people's shops will have made something happen there that might not have happened otherwise. And so I think that before we talk about the different models, those models have often come about because of the value that is or isn't placed on that space by somebody else. An artist usually takes space that nobody else wants at a moment in time. And then they give it value because they give it activity. And they often attract other people who then give value to the spaces around them. So, so I sort of wanted to say that to say actually, artists bring something with them, even if that's not their purpose, even if all they want is a quiet space to do something in to get out the house or the bedroom. Um, so then in terms of different models, I suppose I've worked on just about every model going. Um, and I think it's important to think as artists, do we want, do we want um, a really temporary space? You know, because probably if it's really temporary and nobody else wants it, we can get it free for a little bit and nobody will mind. Or do we want temporary space that's there for the medium term? You know, lots of local authorities, institutions have space that they don't want to give away, 
but they're happy for somebody to use a peppercorn or low rent until they've made their mind up what they want to do with it. But they don't want to make any commitment because at any moment they might want to take it off you. And then there's permanent rented space and then there's permanent owned space. And then there's that regenerative value that those spaces can bring to other spaces and places. And I think they're, they're a kind of whole tier. And I've just worked with a really interesting guy in Salford who's just gone over to Stockport on a bit of a promotion. And, and he came up with that as a triangle and said, actually, he tried giving spaces to people who'd never run them before. And it was a disaster. And it meant he could never do it again because his reputation in the local authority was the pits. Um, and so he came up with this kind of triangle that said, well, actually, I'll give anybody free, really temporary space if I've got it, um, because they can cut their teeth on that. And actually, if they can do that, then probably I'd talk to them about five-year space. But somebody who's had a five-year space and managed to make it work, actually, we'll talk about asset transfer to them because it's worth it and they can bring activity to a space that we're finding it difficult to use or heritage space or something like that. So, so the structures around in this country, I think, are really evolving quite rapidly for what people are willing to do and the value they place on having artists in a space or place. Um, Rogue Studios, I worked very briefly with them when they were kicked out of central Manchester and they suddenly realised they had a value and they knocked on some local authority doors and said, give us a space and we'll all come to your place where nobody else is and we'll bring some activity with us. And they got a free school out of it. Um, and, and, and I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, so that suits them fine. It's not a forever space, but it is a long-term space because that town wanted that activity in the middle of it. Um, some of the other sort of examples, um, Islington Mill I work at and have worked at for about seven years over in Manchester. Um, but that was actually bought by some an artist who's bloody-minded on bridging finance. It took him 20 years to get off bridging finance. I do not recommend it to anybody because it's really expensive money and he ran up a huge debt that he is still paying off. Do not buy a property on bridging finance if you can help it. But if you're really bloody-minded and determined to grab some space that is owned by artists, for artists, forever, and there's no other way of doing it, then go and talk to Bill Campbell at Islington Mill Studios because he had the nerve. I think it nearly killed him. Um, but that space is now owned by artists forever or for, for as long as he owns it. And they've, on the back of that, tripled their footprint by persuading the local authority that artists have a value. And Salford now has a strategy and a mayor who says artists are welcome here, we want them and we will create space for them because they have a value to our economy and our communities. They have a cultural value, but they also have a financial value. Um, so their impact has been quite big over time, um, but 20 year time. Um, if I kind of, I've had the luxury with Baltic Creative going around the world a bit. So I'll pick on a couple of other examples. In, um, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, where I got to go and look at artist studios, I asked one guy how he did it. I said, oh, you know, is the public grant or public money? He went, oh, my God, no. Nobody here touches public money because if you take public money, everybody thinks you're corrupt. We don't touch it and neither do the private sector. So you cannot give public money away in Tazakhstan and Uzbekistan to artist studios. And he does a really simple deal. He knocks on the door of people who have buildings that are underused and says, it's your building. You do the basic fit out. I'll bring the artists and we'll split the profit 50-50. And he has a really cute business model. He's doing really well. Um, in Oslo, um, an artist studio there, that was a bank who had um, assets that are sitting on their balance sheets that they don't want to sell, they don't want to develop, but they're happy for somebody else to use. And so they're, they're giving out 99-year licenses to community and arts groups um, as, a, as, a, as a way of keeping that active in the street, but of them acquiring the slow rise in asset value. So they're not giving that value away, but they're giving the space away. Um, and then just, I can see that 
um, I probably need to stop talking, so I'll just give one more example. Um, working over with Salford Keys at the moment and a guy called Paul Wright from What If Group. So that's Peel Owned Development. He's a shopping centre specialist and everyone's talking shopping centres all, all of a sudden. But the model they've come up with is to say, well, we save the business rates for Peel Holdings. So 50% of that business rates will go back into running those spaces. So they share the saving they make, the efficiency saving they make on the business rates to help run the artist spaces in a semi-permanent way within the space in that they're hoping to support some of those artists to move into commercial space, but rec recognizing the value that always having artists in that space has a value. So again, the sophistication of the models that are around are really moving fast. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to ask about that is because it feels like there's there's the will to explore things, there's the models to be explored, but it sort of how do you prime the door you're knocking on to raise that as an idea, whether that's you know. A, a regeneration boss, whether that's, you know, a mayor or a council leader or a local councillor, how do you prime someone who has no idea what an artist studio is, what it does, to kind of go, I've got this mad idea, right? How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, and I, and I think that's often what I do, and I think what you and Patrick have done with the report. I think you've got to take everybody along with you, and so it's quite a slow process because... You know, the, the people in Salford Council didn't understand the artists and the artists didn't understand the council. So they all think everybody's anti each other. When in fact, if they can come together, they realise that actually they have a common objective, which is to make sure that space is creatively and fully used within any locality. And it's finding that common objective. And I think then working through, well, what's realistic and realisable? I do think I have that advantage and, you know, I couldn't do what I'd done now if I hadn't worked on that other side of the fence and realised that actually, you know, capital developments are not rocket science. There's not some mystery to them. And this word of, you know, does it stack up? Well, it all depends on which way you're cutting the cake, really. Anything can stack up if we want it enough and anything can not stack up if we don't want it enough. Um, so it's really of what value can we demonstrate the value of this to the person we're asking to invest in it what are they going to get out of it I think we're really good as artists at saying well we want this out of it and we can bring this to it and you know talking about ourselves how do we say to somebody else actually culture has a value and I met a really interesting woman on me travels in Finland and she worked for the Finnish government um, lovely job because it was she, she employed 80 artists and it was her job to make sure that creativity and artists worked in every industry sector in Finland because they know that is where the future lies um, and that wasn't artists working on you know non-artist things that was artists working in the maritime industry doing residences or um artists solving problems of how to get young people to stay in rural villages in Finland because they all want to move to urban centres. So really interesting challenges and in approaching those in really creative, artistic ways. Um, but what they managed to do was persuade the Finnish government that artists have a value and her strap line is that artists are experts in creativity. Why would you not want creativity in every industry sector in the UK? But we've got to talk about it in in economic terms or placemaking terms or whatever, or use translators who can do that. Amazing. We're going to bring back everyone now as well. So um, Patrick and Brigitte and, and Claire and um, Michelle yeah. as well. To just kind of tie everything together and just kind of like throw the question out there. What does what does everyone think? What's your what what sort of what do you think we need to do in Liverpool City region? Brigitte, you go because I know you'll have a, I know you'll have thoughts on this. Uh, 
and yeah, we can't. Oh, am I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks very much for um, showing us pastures greener than the UK pastures at the moment, um, and uh, dreaming of of Ireland or uh, Norwegian models. Um, I think, you know, I think there were two things, and I think the report has highlighted something, uh, uh, which is that, you know, it would be good to have a greater awareness of all the creative people and the various studios which are in Merseyside or, uh, you know, the Liverpool City region, as it's called. So I think that's that's kind of always good. It's kind of shout, shout about what a great place it actually is to create work and to make work. And it is, in comparison to other parts of the country, extremely affordable. I mean, you know, rather than being depressed about it, you know, in comparison to, you wouldn't be able to get, you know, unless in the East End of Manchester, you wouldn't be able to get a studio for £100 a, a month anymore. Forget it. I mean, I, I, and I think, and, and then there is, of course, you know, if I would put my Arts Council head on, although I'm not an Arts Council person, I think it's it's appalling how many people still get tripped up by bad landlords and 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 kind of, you know, have insecure, as, are in unsafe buildings. I mean, it's all very well going in, in, a, in, in an old building if as long as it's safe, you know, and, and whatever else, and you make those decisions. But, I mean, I must admit that some of my, you know, young graduating students, I mean, they just get pulled over, you know, pulled over the table. Um, and, and rates, you know, in business rates. I mean, I didn't know anything about business rates until I suddenly realized that where I am, I don't have to pay any business rates because it's such a disadvantaged neighborhood. Maybe tomorrow when Rishi announces his um, budget, it might all change and I, I'll have to start coughing up business rates and then my fragile model of self-financing and and very low rents or low rents and you know just keeping it ticking over will will disappear so i think i think this sort of you know the next so how what what to do next next would be to be able to you know have everybody who is anybody in the region uh, in town, send councils and have a little handbook of whatever you know the landscape of the creative industry within, uh, um, you know, the region. So I think that's important. Um, on a, on another level, I think the, the the push and pull of being closed and being open. I mean, not now kind of you know as in what it's a bit like having a car fixing place or any other workshop there are you know we are producers of something so therefore we have to have our sort of you know kind of you know zones where which are not open to the public and then there are zones which are open to the public and i think i think covid has stopped us from having those public zones whether it is on openings or just hanging out in the blue coat and meeting each other and, and, and networking in real time and space or meeting counselors. I mean, it was really crazy. I had, I, you know, the, 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 I had a video of my work commissioned by the Williamson and then somebody knocked on my studio door and it happened to be a counselor from the rural, you know, <laughs> saying, Oh, I really, really like your work. I mean, you know, look, you know, and, and it, it, it's in a way it's crazy because I'm not advertising um, my space very much, but it was kind of quite nice. So this sort of weird, weird sort of um, what is a studio in relation to where it is. So this is about placemaking um, and and also about placemaking in relation to the safety net of artists. I mean, APT in Deptford or the Brightwell, which is an art in perpetuity trust, are great models. And Islington builds a sort of halfway between being an APT model and, you know, and kind of, you know, that ultimately secures not only for us, but for future generations, city centre spaces. I bumped into somebody in London, in, in, in Deptford, a sculptor, who said, like, he had to get an industrial shed somewhere between on the railway truck between you know London and Brighton because as a sculptor there's nowhere to make any work anymore in London it's too expensive when the spaces are too small like what Pete Clark said little cardboard boxes so we have a wealth of fantastic spaces but what we are not good is in communicating the different models on making these spaces more secure 
you know i mean including you know what people do do like green building including pooling money and buying something i mean you know as you know i'm not saying buy some pop i mean you know and I'm, I'm i'm annoyed with myself i didn't buy a really cheap terrace because then in Birkenhead, because then I could have proper residencies and provide people with a little space where they could live as well. Yeah, art, artist, artist accommodation as well. Art Claire, I was really interested. I was really interested, Claire, the thing that you said about regeneration plans in the offing, because I think for a lot of us in Liverpool, that has always been a bit of, it's always a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Regeneration, and it has been in Liverpool. How are you feeling about it in St. Helens? Um, both of those things from one one place to another, um, at various, various points in time. Um, yeah, there's that trepidation of what happens, but also trying to have that sort of positive side of well we're here and I think as Erica was saying about that model of you've had a temporary space and then you've had a, a five-year space you know, probably longer and then you know that you feel like you're in a position and that that people are talking to us as well and that we're talking you know there's quite a, seems to be quite a building community in St Helens over the last few years all of organizations and arts council funding has kind of been supporting a lot of the organizations in St Helens so I think it feels like there's a, I wouldn't say a steady base because it's the arts um, but that there's something there that feels like we can say well can we do this and what was Brigitte was just saying there about live workspace that's that's something that we're also thinking about and discussing with the artists who are looking at what we can what we can do next what you know what are the benefits to that and how can yeah how can that happen and when you were asking earlier about what next I, I was making me think well what's what what can we do next and i think that sense that it's kind of again another double-edged sword thing all of the arts organizations who exist who exhibit work and things like that um are all are all there and i think just uh, just making sure that those communications stay open between those arts organisations and the studio spaces, I think, is really important. And they're not, they're often on shifting sands as well. You know, the arts, the arts organisations are relying on funding from Arts Council and NPO every three or four years. And, you know, it, the whole sector is, you know, isn't a stable thing. But that just making sure that we help each other out and that that's those spaces where the people who are creating the work, who are creating the, the things that are of value, um, that, that can still happen for, and at, at lots of different stages as well. You know, there's lots, uh, I've been doing this for years, but there are people who haven't. And how, how do we make sure that, that the me from 15, 18, however many years ago that is, can do, can do that now because things have changed so much? Yeah, I think, Michelle, I'm really interested in your perspective on this because with the, you know, the, the Aspen Yards perspective, there's artists at a lot of different stages in their career in that space. Does it, as an artist, does it make you feel more secure, like you're more plugged in or do you need more of that? Do you feel like you need to be more plugged into the rest of the studio network, the rest of the gallery network? Oh, of course, you need to be more plugged into the whole of the nest of the networks because you're still very isolated because no matter how much you're connected, it's such a small nucleus, is it not? You know, that's only five of us are five in a, in a block as well as the rest of the creators on the site. And to be honest, one thing what jumped out from me since I've been in Aspen Yard is the amount of African creators who keep coming, clamoring for space. Maybe, like I say, we're not even aware of what was there because I wasn't aware of the network until obviously this, and I've delved a lot more into it, somewhere I was, I was familiar with. So some of the things like Erica flagged up, I mean, I, I don't know if it's come from my days, at the CLT days, you know, when you spoke about affordable commercial space, it really resonated with me in the subsidy because I know our community's got buildings around, et cetera, and just from the past and what I've seen CLT do, you know, when you mention things like the 99-year lease, and building these conversations because where do we start because if there's a load of people and a whole grounds full of people under this undercurrent of artists and you might say as usual you know for what's lacking in the diversity and access 
you know, where do we go and where do we start? So I feel warmed. I'm obviously warmed by being where I am and in the conversation. I'm seeing the models, no disrespect, you know, whether it's Oslo or Finland, those things kind of warm me. So it's about how can we take on board some of that, but where do we start? So I'm, I'm, I'm in a, as an individual in a privileged position, you know, but there's so many that aren't. And even with the character that I am, I actually make it my business to kind of know and find out more because I'm pretty much painfully aware and just pain with the lack of networks that we have, you know, or not utilizing. You know, so like Claire said, the person who's 15 years down the line or wherever they are, where can we go? And it is nice for me to link with artists who've been practicing artists for a long time and they've had studios or not, whether it's new people coming in because it's the whole range and the people in this whole social entrepreneur network. Is, that's why I say creators and artists because there's this whole social entrepreneurs what are out there and it's just how do we kind of come together to make this these new changes and have more you know so it's building into what exists there and I'm always about building in it's also ways to create new and utilize some of what's around us too you know definitely Patrick when when Brigitte was saying about um unsafe space I coun't help thinking about when we were in George Henry Lee's for uh, Independence Day a few years ago, um, <laughs> which was a treat. Um, what, what do you think about sort of the, the what what the sort of studios need across the city region? You 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 talk to people in every one of the boroughs that kind of like in Liverpool city region. What what do you think is is needed? For oh, um, a lot. Yeah. Um... A lot. I, I, I think there is the. I think, like like Erica said, the, there's an element of um, everybody blaming each other and expecting things to to, to be done by by others. Um, you know, one one thing in the studio report that we um, that, that I think was in the studio report. So was um, when when we started out. With the report, we, we tried to ensure that there was a an understanding of the artists who were actually in those spaces uh, and the demographics in those spaces and representation within those spaces. And we just couldn't get those figures because the studios didn't know how to collect them, which seems quite basic. You know, it did something you can do a Google search to work out how to do a, a data collection form and, and find out what artists are in your studio. Um, we did find out that the until Aspen Yard, I, I don't think there'd ever been a black studio director in Liverpool. Um, so it's kind of just that those things that we found out, but we can't report on properly because there isn't the data and there isn't that um, there isn't there isn't the structure there. But again, that's not the fault of studios that there isn't the structure there because that goes right back to to art school and the format you're taught and you're not taught to develop business structures at art school. So artists don't know how to develop business models. Um, and the artists that do it, do it incredibly well, because again, as Erica said, creatives are experts in being creatives. So it sort of, it all comes back to the same circular thing. Everyone is always going to blame somebody else for what they do, but there is, I think a lot of it is to do with looking at the bits that you can't do and working out who can help you with them. Um, and not, you know, I, I, so I don't know if that's, just, I'm just being very pessimistic. I'm having a pessimistic day, um, but it's sort of, you know, I, I think there, there are a lot of things that we can't do and you only get them done by asking the people who can do them um, or, for, or searching how to do it. Um, if that is, if it's the case of, you know, why can't we make studio improve? Sorry, go on, Erica. I'm starting to ramble anyway. So, so I just wanted to say, oh, so I was feedbacking it. Um, I just wanted to say, don't underestimate what you have done because what you've started to do in the report you've written is you've started to chunk it up, as I call it. So instead of being lots of small competing voices, we're beginning to see, well, there's 500 artist studios in the city region. And you begin to be able to say, well, wouldn't it be fantastic if it was a thousand? Um, and we have a city region mayor who's just run a land commission who has begun to question, albeit tentatively, who gets to own space in our cities and who doesn't? And do we really want cities 
that in another 10, 15, or maybe even two years' time, are completely owned by somebody who lives in the Cayman Islands and we're all renting off them. And he's kind of saying, no, actually, we do want cities that are owned by the collective us. What does that look like? And I think you have begun the process of painting a picture to him and others of what that could look like and the value that has to the city. Yes, you need some resource to make that a bigger and stronger case. And yes, you need collective voices to support you in that. But I think you have begun that process. So I think think about what you have done. And yeah, there's always better data could have been collected. But some of it's just about using what you've got and wrapping it with a red ribbon and going, we've got the answer, even when you've only got half of it. But Greta, go on. What were you going to say? You're on. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that's really important because I think in the end, the report is a feasibility study of the status quo as it is, isn't it? With with you know, with gaps which still need to be filled. So so the kind of question is, you know, uh, does one live with those gaps or will other people pick it up on that that on on that level, you know? And and I think what we talked about before the conflict of interest you said to yourself you know you were in the position of doing the report because you you were funded to a certain extent or even poorly to do it and i suppose what all it's all it's always a kind of a question of human resources and you mentioned before like kind of you know this thing kind of nearly killed somebody i mean not you know mentally i mean not necessarily physically so 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 we, we you know all of us especially you know, you know, we are having two, three, four jobs, you know, carers, uh, artists, uh, studio organizers, freelancers, you know, the whole lot. So the little bit of volunteering to keep our studio group growing or to keep it ticking over is something which sort of, you know, comes and goes in 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 irregular patterns. And and in that sense, the more you see yourself as an artist, the more the more unwilling you are becoming to chuck away time to do what I call glorified paper clipping. I'm not saying it's not important, it's vitally important, but I also kind of realize that, you know, if I have a choice between doing X, Y, Z in, in terms of paper clipping or going into the studio and and making my work you know i know that the paper clipping in the long run would maybe be better but um you know my my urge to make work is more more you know you know as luther says my mind is willing my my flesh is not you know so they, there is there are these pushes and pulls and in that sense we are never as savvy as let's say the music industry or these guys in the convenient gallery because they have a like like you know they they have a slightly different agenda they are not they're not saying, oh, I'm an artist and I'm also having this space. They've already made that decision that they become facilitators of something else. They've made that decision already. I don't want to be a facilitator for something else, maybe once a year or twice a year. First and foremost, I want to have a space which is secure and big enough to facilitate myself being a good artist, you know, ultimately. Ultimately, you know, and I think I think the 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 uh, you know, and and in that sense, the kind of the the wide range of studios which are available and the different models in which they are operating, is really important because because you know Pete Clark doesn't need to worry about you know leaking roofs because because he's in a refurbished listed building, um you know I needed to get somebody in to build, rebuild a wall recently but I have the space I need to make sculptures you know as much as I would have liked to be in the blue studio that wouldn't have been no you would have needed the bloody floor you know <laughs> higher floor sorry I'm space hungry so you need to so so I think and then around the corner from me is a studio where people want to be social because they all you know they're depending on so they have very little space but they they, they talk a lot and they do a lot together. So I think the the the, the each of us artists or, or creative 
practitioners a need to find the right kind of space to make the work they want to make. And think, in that sense, there isn't one size fits all. But what I think the insecurities of being pushed into regeneration, into regeneration is tiring and exhausting. And it deflects from what our job really is, being artists. You know, and, and, that's, and that's, that's such a great um, place to finish on, Brigitte. Um, we've come to the end of that. And folks, I could talk for another two hours, but I'm not going to make people listen to that. Um, and I think it's quite good that we're not all in the same room together because A, we're going to get locked in the blue coat and B, we just all go to the pub and stay there till closing. But that for another day. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, first to the panel, to Erica, to Patrick, to Brigitte, to Claire and Michelle. If you want to find the report that Patrick and I wrote, if you search for State of the Art Studios, Liverpool, it will come up in Google. And stay tuned to Blue Coat for all the rest of the events they've got in this Creative Communities program. Thanks so much for, for joining us for this today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we forgot to take a picture. Can I just quickly take a picture, please? <laughs> Are you OK if I take a picture? Isn't that what the convention is now? <laughs> the new convention of split screens. Are you all happy for me to take a picture? Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye.